do well. Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming on this uh, fine April evening. Um, before we get on to the main meetup, um, Vicky Toomey Lee is one of the well-known kind of community organizers around Dublin. She, uh, Coding Grace, Pi Ladies, Women in AI, I know there's a few other things you do, the, the makerspace stuff, loads. I, I can know. do an intro oh, if you want. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, she is involved with Europython, which is a conference that's coming to Dublin and uh, yeah she just uh, as you know part of the community thing she's just gonna tell everyone about it so I'll hand over to Vicky um, and then yeah to let you tell everyone about it. Um, thanks Mick for um, having me this evening um, so yeah my name is Vicky and um, I've been um, running a lot of tech events for quite a long time for over a decade or something it started off with Python Ireland that's where the Python thing came along. So I uh, ran their, um, the Irish conference here before as well, the first few editions, PyCon Ireland. And, um, and it's all because of your Python, um, if you want it. You, so there's a story behind that as well, which I won't say talk about tonight. Uh, TLDR, uh, PyCon Ireland happened because of your Python. And 10 years later, your Python uh, came, um, said they'll host in Dublin. That was 2020. So I waited, I finally waited 10 years and then COVID hit. And then um, it got delayed again and again <laughs> for two years. And they're finally gonna be here um, this July um, at Dublin. Um, if I can actually change the slides um, at the convention center here in Dublin. Um, it's for those who don't know where it is, it's, it's right smack in the city center. Um, for those who also don't know how the structure of your Python, it's a week long event. Um, the first two days is um, is at, uh, our tutorials and workshops. So you'll have like beginners days um, and you'll have like advanced tutorials and workshops. And then um, between Wednesday and Friday is the core part of the conference. So you have your conference talks, you have your keynotes, uh, and then there's various different conference events as well happening um, and social events. And then you have Saturday and Sunday, which uh, is um, bring your own project to hack, or you there might be some core the core Python folks there as well that you might want to join in and do sprints with. So that is kind of the the rough structure of the the week um, for EuroPython. Um, the events I mentioned this before. Um, so. Um, the workshops like the beginner's day, the Django girls workshop um, and um, the electronic workshop, which is the PPU workshop. So I can, you know, so I, I have my own version. It's going to be slightly different. It's kind of like this. So it's kind of LEDs. You can actually code in Python, you know, circuit Python. Um, uh, and, um, and there's a transcode workshop as well. And so those will be during the Monday and the Tuesday. And then during um, Wednesday and Friday, there's going to be a maker fest. So that's kind of, um, that's sort of like my baby. I think I suppose was my idea. So as Mick mentioned, um, besides the tech events, I also was a maker advocate for the Dublin maker um, team who run the maker festival here in Ireland every year. And uh, so I still had sort of my maker hat on. So maker advocacy hat on. So I wanted to bring together all the local makers and the maker spaces and, sh and showcase themselves and their projects, especially anything to do with micro Python or circuit Python. And we'll have a general makers table. And for anyone who's bringing kids along because your Python um, uh, also has child minding, uh, will we'll provide child minding as well. So hopefully they'll bring families along if they're visiting uh, Dublin. So we'll have some youth activities like um, uh, the code clubs like Coder Dojo, who are part of Raspberry Pi uh, Foundation. Uh, and we'll have the Northern Ireland Raspberry Pi Jam coming down from Belfast. And we'll have the MicroBit folks coming from UK as well. And so on. we're still working on other activities and we'll have a general makers table for people who just want to learn about soldering or want to learn about, you know, uh, getting Python, writing some Python code to control LED lights or making circuits work and stuff. Um, and then yes, with um, and the la one of the points that Irish, the our Irish and Northern Irish tech community mixer is basically well, um, is is where Dublin Data Science is part of that community. We're trying to highlight a lot of the communities for visitors who are coming to Ireland, all the tech community uh, folks, um, um, all the tech community groups who are promoting Python. So we want so um, when visitors come along, they can meet all the organizers and all the community members, and hopefully. Um, 
in their future Europe Pythons, they'll highlight other community groups all over Europe for every city they're going to visit. So, uh, uh, so it's like, so they're bringing the, all the community together, all the Python community together um, under the, uh, with Europe Python as the platform to connect everyone. So um, thanks again for Mick and the team for, you know, joining us uh, as a community partner and help join all the dots. Um, so uh, yeah, how can I help you help? Of course, volunteering. Um, there's a, like, even right now, there's a volunteer call. Um, they all run all their stuff through Discord, um, but they're also looking for coaches, mentors, facilities for various different workshops. So for me, for instance, I'm running the Django Girls workshop. I'm looking for a few coaches to help me out. Transcode as well, looking for you know, um, uh, folks to help on that workshop as well, as well as allies. Um, and also, and also first time speakers, if you want to help mentor first time speakers um, at the conference, um, you know, we're looking for, for people as well. Uh, in, of course, spread the word, invite your friends, colleagues, anyone uh, who might be interested or using Python uh, to come along to, to, your, uh, to, to the conference. And, um, and we mentioned sprints, so you can actually bring along your open source project as well, or your project to hack during the sprints. And yeah, we'll, we definitely, you know, again, once again, want to highlight, you know, spread the word on social media. That'd be amazing. Um, uh, so the call to actions, um, right at the moment is we still have early birds available. Um, I, mentioned, um, I mentioned we're looking for coaches for Transco Django Girls and first time speakers, but registrations for Django Girls, if you know someone who wants to learn, um, uh, uh, a complete beginner who wants to learn about Django. Uh, applications are open right now. And I'm always looking for makers who want to demo um, at the MakerFest. And if, uh, if your company or you know any other companies that you come across who want like to um, sponsor, sponsorships are also open as well to help support the event. Um, but the conference itself is run by uh, all volunteers. No one's paid to run the conference. So any money that comes into Euro, Euro Python um, and it goes back into your Python for the uh, uh, for all the activities and also help with the financial aid. So we do have financial aid for anyone who needs to help uh, needs help with either free ticket or subsidized accommodation and travel. Um, so um, yeah, I'll just wrap up now. And um, if anyone has any questions or you want to collaborate, uh, we do. Uh, um, the email there is for the community at Europe, so for all the organizers, but we also have, um, uh, 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 I'll probably update the slides as well. There's a kind of a, a sponsoring at Europe.eu for anyone who's interested in sponsoring, but all there's a lot of information like the FAQ you can find at Europe.eu. Um, all the latest updates are on, uh, on via Twitter and Europe. And uh, the folks have started to use um, uh, kind of a, a monthly um, newsletter to let people know about the upcoming events, uh, especially tech communities um, like uh, like this one. Um, any kind of uh, uh, information about the cool libraries that you come across. Um, so any kind of information, upcoming information within the Irish tech community, and then Europe Python information like milestones of like um, the currently they are reviewing. For anyone who's bought tickets for Europe, then you um, you can actually help review talks as well. So if they've extended the, the the dates for that. So all that kind of information is on the blog. But if you subscribe to the blog, you also get an email of that uh, of the um, of the um, whenever they do an update on the blog. So um, I suppose um, that's all for me. I don't know if anyone else have any questions about specifically about your Python activities I, or how do you get- I involved. actually have a quick one, Vicky, yeah. just the events that you mentioned there, I presume there's no schedule for that yet. That's kind of TBD, uh, is it? So these ones you but, mean? Yeah and, yeah, the, and the other one on the other page as well, I think there was um, a couple of, was it? So, uh, so- No, it must've been, no, it must've been the other one. Yeah, so be. the so the workshops um, themselves are generally held on so the Django Girls workshop will be on a Monday for now so um, yeah. just take it that Monday and Tuesday will be workshop days and tutorial right. day so anything to do with workshops will be held in the first two days and uh, and then the core conference days will be Wednesday Thursday and Friday and yeah. that's where the Maker Fest is and right. also for any of the community um, organizers you want to mingle they have there's a uh, 
there's an open spaces. So your Python is a very very big proponent of using open spaces to 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 for people who want to gather and talk outside of you know going to talks and things like yeah. that. And it'll be in the same space as the where all the exhibitors are as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's so no there'll be different other space social, in the conference there, room. Yeah, there's definitely going to be other social events which I haven't mentioned here. So. Um, there might be like um, I'm still t trying to figure, trying to see if there will be like a pie ladies lunch or uh, or something like that. Um, but there's lots of other kind of side social events that are still sure. in the works and people are just coming out. So if you have an idea that you say, oh, that might be great to do, do to run a Europython, uh, just jump on board the um, you know the volunteer train and suggest your ideas. That's what the um, the the, the pla what we call the plazas where all the organizers are. Yeah, that's what, that's what it's for. Um, yeah, everything is all in motion. Um, the only thing, so um, at the moment they are um, doing the community votes for the talks, and then they have some expert reviewers, uh, which they did a call for I think last week or so, um, to help also to review uh, in their specific expertise to review go through the talks. So once they picked the, whatever number of talks. It is the schedule will appear um and on the right. side we're all also looking for keynotes so if you think there's an amazing keynote uh, you know not the usual uh pike on keynote you want to see someone different and you see and you, you've come across them and you want that team will look after that um but yeah they, oh, everything like the, there's a new board this year everything's kind of new there's kind of completely new flow of energy going around so um that's why there cool. used to be like a plethora of mailing lists now it's like they're trying yeah. to slip to to slim slim down on a lot of things but yeah certainly uh, more information about dates will come along but if there's any workshops norm uh, normally it'd be at the beginning of the week and then you have the core conference with the keynotes and the maker fest events and social events and then you have the Saturday and Sunday, which is sprints. And that normally is open for everyone. You don't need to have a conference ticket as far as I'm aware. Right. Um, uh, sprints are normally, um, uh, yeah, it's not everyone goes, goes sprinting anyway, goes to yeah. sprints. So that, that, yeah, so that's it. Um, so if there's kind of anything, you can also um, drop me an email at vicky at your Python.eu as well. Um, the community one just goes to the team that looks after the um, the, the the tech communities um, that, that um, at, that hopefully will come along to your Python. Sure. <laughs> uh, and many more. And, and if you think of any other groups that I haven't gotten contact with, more than welcome to drop us a mail and join us as well. And we have, um, we actually do, uh, uh, we said we're going to launch a, a listing, a, a webpage with listings of all the community groups. So we're just, um, I th think it's kind of live, but um, I don't know when they're going to tweet it out, but it will be tweeted out really, really soon. It's right. just that they needed blurbs from from some groups and we didn't we haven't got all of them yet <laughs> cool okay cool um i will okay. stop sharing now thank you thank you again for your time and no problem vicky and, and like everyone. i said if if anyone or the other alternative you can anyone here is interested can get in touch with me and i can relay everything to you as totally well as... yeah yeah um okay cool. thank you so much and have a no great problem. evening everyone yeah. and thanks for your time bye-bye no problem see you vicky cool all right um well thanks for that um yeah like i said if anyone's interested they are meant to be very cool events so uh, we were happy to facilitate that but yeah without further ado we can move on to the main event so um jonathan adams i met a couple of years ago at a in a conference that's now called the insurance data science conference but it was known as our insurance back then um and he gave a fascinating talk on our minions and basically a way to scale up all your his monte carlo uh simulations that he was doing because you he was working in uh insurance in crop insurance i believe is that still where you're working jonathan that is yeah yeah so anyway and then we happened to one of this uh one of the few benefits of uh covid has been that uh while you know it did like conferences weren't nearly as good because they were all online it did it did make them very accessible to everyone on the planet so i kind of met jonathan last year at the conference again online and um, it just occurred to me that his t if he was willing to give a talk on this particular topic, because uh, I've always had it in my background, I've never quite had to actually implement it because I never quite got to the stage where I needed to um, on the various projects I tend to work at the start. Although there was one project that came very close that we never quite got to, and I have a funny feeling it might get used down the line. But it was basically all about like scaling and parallelizing. So that's kind of what he's going to talk about tonight. 
Uh, you've heard more than enough of me, so I'm going to hand over to Jonathan. And uh, yeah, once once we're done, we'll have a bunch. Like I said before, for those of you who haven't been to these before, we try to make it as interactive as possible. I'm going to largely go on mute, but kind of jump in with questions. But by all means, if anyone else has any questions, just pop them in the chat there. I kind of have a two screen setup and I'll be keeping an eye on any questions or whatever. And I'll probably Jonathan is more than happy to kind of make this discursive. So I'll just kind of jump in as at, at an appropriate moment. And uh, yeah, we can address it. So please, by all means, don't be shy. Um, put all your questions in. But yeah, Jonathan, if you want to share your screen and uh, I'll shut up. All right. Well, thank you, Mick. It's uh, good to be here. I'm a big fan of uh, the Dublin Data Science Group. I uh, met, uh, as Mick said, I met him, uh, I guess it was about nearly six years ago in June. At the, uh, at the time, it was the was RN Insurance. Wow. What year? Well, was, you'd know the year. 2016. Yep, 2016. Oh, wow. I, okay. I, I, re I remember that distinctly because uh, I happened to snag a ticket to Wimbledon final at 2016. So that's oh, like wow. burned in memory. Yeah. Were you watching in Wimbledon at the final? Yeah, I had was a the weekend you court. were here, like, because you were in Dublin on it the Friday. Was. Did I, you go to I flew in and landed in Dublin and ran as quick as I could to connect to the Wi-Fi and somehow managed to uh, to make the window for them opening up some of the tickets the day before. Nice, nice. Because I know you did have so a then pint I went with to Wimbledon me and Bose that night. Insurance. You did have a, a pint with me and Bose on the Friday night. I do remember that, like, yep. after the conference. But I didn't realize you were flying to the UK the next day. Wow, okay, that's... That's some hardcore traveling oh, no, right no, no, there. No, 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 I, I went to I went to Wimbledon the the day before the conference, and then oh, I, right. I, I met with you flying back the to, to the United gotcha. States. But uh, so a little bit about me. My name is Jonathan Adams. I uh, I reside in Texas, specifically the town of Lubbock, Texas, or at least outside of there. For those not terribly familiar, Lubbock is this tiny little town in the middle of literally nothing but cotton fields and cattle farms. Uh, and basically, as I was telling Mick before this started, the, the nearest town to me that is worth anything is at least a two hour drive and that's going 70, 75 miles an hour. So the Texas is quite big and I'm in the middle of like the most secluded part of it. But thankfully we get good enough internet uh, so I can connect up with y'all. Uh, so I hold a bachelor's degree in mathematics and a master's degree in statistics from Texas Tech University, the uh, local university here in Lubbock, Texas. And then I got a job in crop insurance about 10 years ago. And basically, they gave me a computer and said I could do whatever I wanted with it. So I told myself, well, the first thing I'm going to do is install R and I'm going to start teaching myself R by just forcing myself to use it for any and every project that gets assigned to me. So I started out just learning scripting and just uh, super just, simple. Actually, commands. just to cut across you, why, why did you choose R if you didn't know it at that point? Just uh, out of curiosity. I, I had come across it at, uh, at college or university, and uh, I was familiar with the concept of it, that it was a statistical programming language. Right. And I think I had actually done one small research project with a professor on it, but it was, it was very basic and basically just taught me a little yeah. bit about some of the internal functions, the, the distributions and stuff. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. And I figured, hey, this company is going to let me learn it. So I might as well. Yeah. And uh, so I, I started just basic scripting, super simple, just almost using it as a calculator. And then from there, I started expanding to how to design packages. And uh, around that time, I also started learning uh, formal computer programming because my company was a software shop. And uh, eventually, I started trying to combine the knowledge I had learned with R and the knowledge I had learned with computer programming and started using that to start, in, start integrating R in our systems. And from there, the R Minions package was born. So today I'm going to talk to you about the package. I plan on giving you a little bit of background. Uh, the, the, the beginning of this talk won't actually start with R. It will start with crop insurance, the industry I work in. And then from there, I'll start sort of building why I why I started, uh, or I'll, I'll start going into why I built the R Minions package the way I did and what I was hoping to accomplish with it. And then I will wrap up with a few examples I have uh, that will be run in AWS Cloud. So a little bit of background, uh, as, I, as I, uh, I and Nick said, I work in the United States crop insurance industry. I don't know if you know much about that, but seeing as most, uh, most Americans don't, I assume non-Americans yeah, assume probably I, I, don't. I assume none of us know anything, because so, I know um, I don't. 
So there's a couple of people I know might know something about it, but I think it's safer to to assume that people know what insurance is and very little beyond that. Yep. So crop insurance is pretty much as it sounds. We cover and we sell insurance to insure all of the different commodities that people are growing. So cotton, corn, soybeans. Uh, we insure livestock. In some cases, we even insure, insure things like oysters and apiculture. So it's basically if you grow it or raise it to be eaten, there's a very good chance that we will insure it. Uh, now, crop insurance itself is considered a property and casualty line of insurance, but it's a very niche insurance. And this I didn't actually understand for the first year or two uh, uh, until I was about uh, a year or two into my career. Uh, so I, I was brought on to do actuarial work. So I started researching crop insurance models and actuarial models and things like that. And I was always getting confused because I would read about this model or that model and I would think to myself, well, I don't understand how to apply this in crop insurance. It doesn't make sense to me. So, for example, one of the models I came across was, I think it's called chain ladder, and it's used for developing your losses year over year and month over month. And basically what you do is you take your losses and then you start looking backwards. So you have losses five years down the road and four years down the road and three years down the road. You use the five-year losses to try to predict the four-year losses, what those will be in five years. And then you use those two to try to predict what your three-year losses will be in the next four and five years, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I was reading about this and I just couldn't figure out how I would use that because in crop insurance, you don't have multi-year losses. Pretty much everything happens in about 13 months. You from from start to uh, from the purchasing of the policy to that policy is completely done. Most people they'll be done in six months, but typically the max is 13 months. So I had to start learning about oh, crop insurance is on a much different cycle than your typical property and casualty. We're also interested in a lot. Uh, a lot of different types of data that property and casual companies typically don't care about because it just doesn't affect them, whereas it's core to our business. So as such, we have a lot of unique modeling challenges. So one of these is known as fund designation. Basically what fund designation is, is us purchasing our reinsurance. We, we purchase two types of reinsurance. One of them- You, you, we you might want to explain what reinsurance is. Oh, okay. Most I've, people would know, but just like I said, assume nope, that, that no one. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. So reinsurance, in a nutshell, is insurance for insurance companies. So insurance companies sell insurance, and then they also buy insurance themselves to cover their liabilities. So whenever we sell our insurance policies, we also buy buy some form of coverage for us, so that if all of a sudden we just have millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, of losses more than we ever expected, eventually we can cut those losses off and we we cap what we will lose in a year and then it becomes our insurance company's problem, whoever has sold us reinsurance. Well, there's two types of insurance that we can buy. Uh, one of them, we keep most of the risk, but we also get to keep most of the premium. The other one, if they're riskier, we can offload that risk, but we also keep less of the premium. So it's basically going through our entire book of business and trying to decide which, uh, which policies are good and which policies are bad. And that is, if, if you do that wrong, your company can go under. If you do it right, you can have a great year and make a lot of money. So this is a very important problem in crop insurance, all of crop insurance and uh, because and just ahead. to ask Jonathan uh, like um in, in terms of the risks that you actually insure I mean what are the main things that crop insurance I, I presume like crop failure is one so is it, 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 it anything so uh, we insure literally not even being able to plant because there was too much rain or we ensure that there was no rain so your crops didn't grow we ensure that the the price went down at the last minute now you're not going to make what you thought you were going to make we insure against wind events hail events too much rain blowing sand pretty much anything that and can are, affect your yield and are those all combined as part of a single policy or are they separate products that you would offer there are different most of the, um, a lot of the a lot of the losses are combined but there are different types of products that cover some of them cover different losses but others cover losses in different ways so the majority of them will cover uh yield and revenue but we cover we sell, sell ones that will only cover yield losses we sell ones that will only cover uh price losses we sell ones that actually group everyone together and it looks at your county as a whole so the area that you're farming in how we're 
all of those farmers doing? So you could have a great year, but if all of those farmers did terrible, you could still get a claim because on the average, it was a pretty bad year. Gotcha. And in terms of hedging your risk, um, presumably things like the price, the price insurance presumably is very hedgeable for you because you can just offset it with like futures or yep yep like we've various... looked into we've looked into puts and calls and various options to try to ensure that if the price drops say 50 cents or a dollar we can minimize that and maybe only take 25 percent of that price law uh, price drop and i presume the idea is that you guys like crop insurance sells that to the farmers so that the farmers don't have to insure like in other words they don't have to go through the hassle of actually buying derivatives themselves. Yes, guys it simplifies essentially... their process and it also makes it easier for them to get funding because crop insurance is so well known in the agriculture community. If a farmer wants to go get a farm loan so that they can purchase their seed and their fertilizer and all right. of that, a lot of times the bank or whoever is going to be loaning it to them requires them to have some form of crop Makes insurance sense. policy. Kind of like the way you need life insurance to get a mortgage or a certain, I don't know if you do in the US, but here it's pretty standard, like as part of your mortgage mortgage application you sign up for a life insurance policy for the term of the mortgage yep so um so back on the modeling challenges so fund designation is sort of our biggest modeling challenge and it encompasses lots and lots of big data so some of that data uh, so like i said earlier we're interested in a policy level is this a good policy is this a bad policy so we have insurance specific data what are the yield histories look like for their whole farm what practices are they using are they irrigating are they not irrigating are they leaving the uh, are they leaving the ground unplanted for a year so it can rejuvenate where are they located what types of soil are they dealing with there's lots and lots of different inputs that go into what is the actual yield that eventually gets made on the this piece of dirt. But then there's also general data. So there is what are the commodity prices doing? Since we since we cover the price, one of the main things is basically we take the average price in February for the December contracts. And then that is sort of the starting price, what we will ensure. And then come September, we take the average price of the exact same contracts, but at September. And if the price of those go down, then we cut checks. If the price of them go up, then we don't have to cut checks. So we're very interested in what's this change going to be from February to September of the commodity prices of all of your major commodities, your corn, your soybeans, your peanuts, your wheat, your cotton, all of these. And then also weather is probably the biggest factor because as, as a farmer, weather is, is it's most unpredictable and it is the thing that can affect your bottom line the quickest. Well, in, in the snap of a finger, a hailstorm can come in and just wipe out your entire crop and, and you're left with nothing. Or a tornado can come through and tear down one of your granaries and you harvested everything and you just lost 50 tons of corn that was stored in your granary. It's all spilt out on the field now. And so, so does that mean you do, do you do like asset price modeling as well then like kind of, you know, brown, stochastic Brownian motion type, you know, quant finance type stuff uh, to model some, asset prices? So typically, typically in the models I've done uh, was more of uh, the, 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 the financial model was just trying to basically look at ratios of the actual price in February to the price in September. We're not as interested in the actual path it takes in May, June, July, August. We basically sure. just want to know what was the start and what was the end. And I found that a log normal distribution works really well when looking at those ratios. And then from there, really? I build that into just a cat model. Yeah, interesting. So um, typically log normal, like log normal is the starting point, but usually the distributions are much heavier tail than that in asset prices. So it's interesting when just looking at a ratio between two periods of time, it does a pretty good job. That's that's kind of cool. So uh, these are some of the these are some of the challenges I have, and in building in modeling a lot of this stuff, typically what I do is I build my models in R, I build them into some sort of package, and then I deploy them where I call them locally or whatnot. And usually I have them connected up to a database, so I don't have to pass in tremendous amounts of data. I just say, here's what I want you to do: go to the database, look everything up, run the numbers, save the results to the database. Um, now for small scale modeling, that works really well but in some cases we would like to be able to deploy this live where anybody can call it on the fly if they're opening a claim maybe they want to uh, check one of my models it would be nice if we could have this deployed somewhere so it's e easily accessible by anybody 
So uh, let me take a step back from R and give you a little bit more info on crop insurance itself so I can, I can kind of motivate why I'm interested in the, the software aspect and why I want R as a service. So one thing people uh, might be surprised at is crop insurance is actually a socialized program. Um, and now that, is, that was very surprising to me when I found out about that because the United States typically shies away from socialized programs. But it turns out crop insurance is completely socialized. It is a public private partnership where the government controls all of the rates and how it works. And then private insurance companies take all of that information and actually go out and sell all of the policies and work all of the claims and handle the collection of the premiums and things like that. Then all of that data, all of that money goes back to the government and then eventually a few months later we settle up with accounting processes and they pay us our portion of the premium uh, they pay us whatever they owe us for uh, our expenses and things like that so, so there's no real rating or pricing involved at all then there is rating but that's all handled by the government uh, right. depart the department uh, the united states department of agriculture has a sub department called uh, rma the risk management agency and they have actuaries and statisticians and people on board who are who are building all of these models and then sending all of the rates to all of the insurance companies. And typically what's the premium, the, like the rate adequacy like? Is it usually pretty decent? What, what do you mean? Uh, As in like, like the premium, they're ch the premiums they calculate, is it usually a pretty yes, decent so premium overall, for the risks? Overall, yes, it's been very, very good. Uh, there's, I think there's only been one year where the industry lost money and that was because there was just a phenomenal uh, drought that hit the entirety of the Midwest, which is the United States corn and wheat belt. Yeah. And it just destroyed crops. And that was, I think, the first and only year where crop insurance as a whole has lost money. Wow. Well, like, was that recently or? That was back in 2012. Right, right. So like, it's been profitable for like, how, how long does this socialized think... program go back? Uh, 20 or 25 years, I think. Right. It might be a little longer than that, but it definitely doesn't predate the 70s. Right, right. Yeah, that's um, interesting. I didn't realize. I mean, obviously, I mean, for those people who are ever involved in the US, like they have the rating tables and you have the admitted and the non-admitted business mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But it's typically done by the companies themselves. I haven't actually heard that. I mean, to me, it makes perfect sense, though, right? And from what you can see there, you compete on other aspects. You're not mm -hmm. competing on price, which is probably a sensible thing to do for important insurance. You probably don't want important. Like it's actually been a big problem in Ireland um, over the last two or three years because rates had came down a lot. And as a result, a lot of companies had made business, had made, you know, lost a lot of money. But then a combination of COVID, Brexit and kind of soft rates meant that a whole load of people left the business. So like types of cover that you need, like professional indemnity, for example, that you cannot operate without it companies were unable to actually get quotes like it wasn't even a question of unaffordable insurance it was that they couldn't get it at all because just no one was no one was quoting for them because it became a policy issue then of like well it's all very well to go and mandating insurance but if you don't mandate anyone sells it then you can actually have you know a pretty major dislocation um so it's interesting that the that's a relatively sensible solution so, um, so since it is, uh, since everyone charges the same rates, we have to figure out some way to compete. So we have two main ways of competing. The first one is our service. So we hire underwriters who are also very good customer service representatives, people that our agents know they can call if they have a problem and the underwriter will do their best to help them and in most cases be able to resolve their issue. Um, we also work on our claims. We know we're going to have claims. We know everyone's going to. So how can we stand out? Well, we want to have the quickest processing and we want to get the check to them as fast as we can, preferably the fastest in the industry, because people, when they know they're owed money, they want it now, especially yep. farmers when they have bills to pay, they have loans yep. to repay. Um, the other way we compete is on our software. So everyone uses our software. All of our agents use our software to do everything. There are certain times throughout the year where Congress has, the United States Congress has passed rules that you have to have this thing done by this date. Nothing will be accepted after that date. So like um, March 15th is our biggest sales window. After March 15th, nobody can purchase anything else. April 15th, they have to report 
uh, their prior yields to us. July 15th, they have to report to us what they actually planted in the ground, how much of it they planted, where they planted it, uh, if they're irrigating it, if they're not irrigating it. So throughout the year, our system is constantly being used for different, uh, for different things. And in the middle of all of these, people are constantly generating reports. Well, uh, as I said a minute ago, those deadlines are set by the United States Congress. So if anything happens to your system on March 14th or March 15th and your system goes down and it's not back up until March 16th, you're out of luck. You've probably just lost half of your business because they literally couldn't get into your system to write an insurance policy and now their insurance can't do anything. You can't make that money. It's a problem. So you have to have a very robust system that's going to handle all of these peak reporting seasons where tens of thousands of people could be using your system all at one time. Right. So as such, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that. You know, that's fascinating. But also, um, the, I mean, your underwriters. What do you? What do underwriters do then? If I mean, they uh, is the risk selection allowed? Are you allowed refuse quotes? So no, we can't. Uh, we can't refuse that. Typically, what they do is there are lots and lots of rules to crop insurance. It's a pretty complex system. Right. So the underwriters know all of that, or a lot of that, and they're there to help the agents when they're asking, "Hey, I want to sell a policy like this. Is that allowed? How do I do right. that? How do I enter this into your system?" or here, how's, here's all my paperwork, can you verify it? They're basically, they aren't classical underwriters, they're more of customer service representatives. Yeah, it sounds actually a lot like an, ins an investment advisor, and they know all the yes, regulatory, in, in a way. they know all the regulatory kind of ins and outs of this, that, and the other. Interesting. Yep. Wow, so, it really is um, different. It really is a very, it's basically a different, calling it part of PNC is almost like a misnomer. Because it's, it's just a very different thing. Yes, it is. That's why I say it is very niche. It, yeah. People look at it and they're like, this is, this is foreign to me. I don't understand any <laughs> of this. So, um, so as I said, one of the ways we compete is on our software. Well, about six years ago, my company at the time started looking at our software and we decided, okay, it's time for an upgrade. Our, our system, it's done great for the past 10 years, but it's old, it's clunky. Nobody likes using it. Nobody likes maintaining it. We need to rebuild. So the first thing we did was started exploring architecture. We settled on an architecture called microservices. Well, before I get into microservices, let me explain the one you're probably more familiar with, which is, excuse me, a monolith application. So it's an application where everything you need is all bundled into one application. And you can think of it as basically an executable on your computer. When you run it, everything that it needs to run is right there. It has access to all of the queries. It, maybe it has access to all the data, all of the models, everything is bundled together, but it's very tight knit. If you need, if you need 10 versions of that application, you have to send out all of the same stuff 10 different times at one application containing everything, even if it doesn't necessarily need that. Well, microservices try to go the opposite direction. They try to break up your application into tiny little pieces that are very specific. So I, I, I have a list here that I, I tried to, to sort of brainstorm for my crop insurance of what, what might microservices encompass? Well, one of them might be billing. You might have a microservice that all it does is it controls when to bill people, printing their bills, figure um, uh, where to mail it, all of that information. Then you might have a separate one for claims, opening claims, paying claims, adjusting claims. All of the information that you need for working your claim might be in your claim service. Then you might have a separate report service. You could maybe have reports and claims, but reports are usually very uh, computationally intensive and you don't want to slow down other people trying to open their claims just because somebody is generating a report. So maybe you put reports into their own service where you could just have this tiny service that all it knows is how to generate a report and that's it. It doesn't know anything about claims. It doesn't know anything about billing. It doesn't know anything else. It just knows reports. Well, that's cool. That sounds really neat. Why couldn't we do the same thing with R? What if we had R as a service? What if we had a way that anybody anywhere could access R just by saying, hey, R, can you run this thing for me and tell me what the result is? Well, that is exactly what I tried to do. So we built a microservice architecture using message queues. Now I'll get into message queues in a minute, but basically what, what the purpose of the message queue was, was just to facilitate communication. You're probably familiar with REST, 
one of the most common ones where you just have your service is listening on some HTTP endpoint. And if you want to access it, you just send a GET request or a POST request or something to say, hey, please do this thing. It does it. It returns you your response. And then you go on about your business. That's really cool. But we didn't want to have to worry about load balancing. We didn't want to have to worry about having 10 versions of our service and then saying, OK, here's a POST request for which service is down, uh, which service is, is the, the least used. OK, send it to that service and then navigate it back. Uh, instead, we settled on message queues because they get rid of that. They basically allow these services to control, uh, uh, to, to determine when it needs to work a message and when not. The way it does this is that all of the messages are stored in a central repository, a central server. So whenever somebody wants to, wants to open a claim, they don't contact the claim service. They just send a message to the central queuing service or server, and then that server says, okay, you want a claim? Here, I know all of my claim services are over here. I'll send it that way, and they'll, one of them will pick it up and work it, and I'll, get, I'll send you the response when that happens. And the reason this, you don't have to worry about, uh, you don't have to worry about load balancing is these are worked on a first come, first serve basis. So whenever a service launches, it connects up to that queuing server and it says, hey, I'm here. I'm just gonna chill until you have something for me the server itself keeps track of the order these services have said, hey, I'm here, and it starts anytime it gets a request, it sends it to the next one in that queue. And it just keeps building and building and building. The service will get that, it'll work it, it'll send the response back, and then it'll tell this, uh, the, the central server, hey, I'm free. If you have anything else, let me know. I'll just be chilling again. So it's really neat because you, you, you remove a lot of this logic, it's handled automatically, and it allows you to seamlessly scale up and scale down. And basically just a lot of, uh, a lot of the communication that used to be, that used to require a lot of, of, of manual coding around just sort of goes away. Um, so as such, what, Presumably as well. I mean, I've, 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 I know a bit about message queues, but I wouldn't say I'm an expert. Presumably as well, though, you can kind of alter the message queue service logic to allow for prioritization as well. You probably could. Uh, our services don't do that. Uh, the, the technology we use called Redis, which I'll be talking about yeah. in a second. I don't know if it has that ability. I've never really looked into that, uh, but we that's just because we've never actually needed to look into that. Yeah. If that is something you needed, I'm sure there's a technology out there that would allow you, that would work as a central repository that would allow you to schedule prioritization and stuff like that. But for us, what this central queue is, is all it is, is it's a messenger. Taking messages, yeah. passing them, taking responses, passing them back and doing it as fast as it can. So that messenger that we chose was Redis. We chose Redis because it's an in-memory NoSQL database. And because it's in memory, it is fast. We have never come close to slowing this thing down. We, I think our peak reporting, we had 20,000 requests a second and they were all just flying through the queue without any issues. Our services and our database slow down long before our Redis does. And it's robust. We've never seen we've never seen any issues with Redis losing a message or anything like that. We've seen lost messages, but it's always been our code that handles the communication, not Redis itself. So um, something else about Redis that I found really cool was it's just strings. All you're doing is you're storing a string in Redis. You're sending a string to Redis. Redis is sending that string to the service. The response is bundled into a string, sent back to Redis, and then that string is sent back to the client. So everything is strings. You don't have to worry about different data types, which is really nice. Um, something else that it has that's really cool is the way it's built for queuing. So you can specify a queue for something to listen on. Well, it can do a, what's called a blocking pop, where it just says, hey, I want to take something from this queue, I'm going to wait indefinitely. All I'm gonna do is sit here and wait until you send me something. I can wait five seconds, I can wait a year, it doesn't really matter. And the queues, you can basically view them as, think of them as an array. So uh, you were talking about EuroPython a minute ago, you can pop and you can push, uh, pop from and push to arrays. Well, that's essentially what you're doing with a queue in Redis. Uh, all of the messages are viewed as an array, you can pop from that queue and you can push to that queue. So whenever, a service wants a message, it pops from that queue. And if there's nothing in that queue, it'll just wait until there is something in that queue. And then Redis will say, oh, by the way, here's something, now go work. Uh, and then lastly, one thing that I really liked about Redis was this package in R called Redux. 
Previously, it was R Redis, but that one has been de deprecated in favor of the Redux package. But there are these two very handy functions in Redux, object to bin and bin to object. What these do is these allow you to serialize R objects as strings so that you can store them in Redis to be passed between a client and a server. Service. So if you have like an S3 class or an S4 class or something like that, you can take that class, pass it to object to bin, and then when it gets sent to the service, it can pass it back to bin to, uh, bin to object, and it gets back out an S3 class or an S4 class that it knows how to work with. And I presume it just saves the object as a binary string. It like converts yep. it to binary and then hexadecimal or whatever, and then it's just... Yep, and I will actually be showing that when uh, when we get to my examples, oh. so you can visually see that. Because it just occurred to me that, that those two objects, those two functions are probably useful outside of Redis. Yeah, you know, yes, just for yeah, they binary are binary serialization. Useful. It just occurs to me. Oh, actually. Mm -hmm. cool. So uh, I've been talking a lot. Well, let's get into that, some actual pictures so I can kind of illustrate what's going on here. So uh, I, I called this uh, package R minions because uh, I, the, the concept actually came to me when I was doing my master's thesis. I needed to run a tremendous amount of simulations on some geospatial data. And uh, I started exploring different ways of doing parallel processing in R. Back then, I used the Snow Library, which worked, but it was it was cumbersome. I really hated using it, but it it got me through my master's thesis, thankfully, in two weeks instead of approximately six months. And uh, it worked. And I did this over Thanksgiving. I had three computers under my desk, and as they were going, I was like, "Man, I'm sitting here eating my Thanksgiving dinner," and I just have my little minions out at work doing all of my computer processing for me. And from there, the name R Minions came to mind because I'm like, I'm Gru, I'm the puppet master. And all of these tiny little things are doing all of the work for me. So in this, uh, in this flowchart, Gru will serve as Redis. It is the messenger. It's the one taking the requests from R and sending them to the little worker services, uh, Kevin and Stuart. So anytime you need a, to make a request, this Redis is always running, R will just say, hey, I would like you to do this thing. The central Redis server Gru will say, okay, I can get that done for you. Well, I have two services connected, Kevin and Stuart. Well, Kevin was the first one to come to me. So Kevin, you get this first message. So it passes that message along to Kevin. Kevin breaks open that message and says, oh, you want to generate 10 P norm, uh, uh, 10 random normal values from, uh, from the normal distribution, mean zero, standard deviation one. I can do that. Runs the R norm function with mean zero, standard deviation one. And it says, okay, I did that. Here's the results and I don't care anymore. It's up to you to figure out what happens to that. So the central server takes that response and says, great, here are, you asked for this, here are your results. Well, if that happens again, it will send another message. Now, Kevin worked that message and after it worked, it reconnected to Redis and said, hey, I'm done, I'm ready to process again. But Stuart, when Kevin got that message, Stuart moved back to the front of the line. He was the next one in the line. So when we do another request, the Redis server says, oh, Stuart, you're next up. Here, go work this one, please. While Kevin then sits around and waits. Well, that's cool for a single message, but what happens if you're, you've got like, 10,000 or 100,000 jobs you need to process all at once. Well, Kevin and Stuart are going to get overloaded really fast. They're going to be going tag teaming back and forth, back and forth, constantly working messages and then saying, hey, do you have anything else for me? They're going to get overloaded really fast. Why can't we just launch up another instance of our service? All you have to do is when you launch another service, you have to connect up to the Redis server and say, hey, I'm here if you have anything for me. We launch it up instantly, connect it, and all of a sudden Redis realizes, oh, I have a third service available. I'll keep track of that. And now whenever Kevin and Stuart are overloaded, I can also start sending stuff to Bob. The great thing is though, Redis doesn't actually have to care if Kevin and Stuart are overloaded. All it cares about is that these three services have connected to it and it just keeps track of the order. And every single time it gets a request, it just sees which is the next one in line, I'll send it to you and you can work on it. So if Kevin can process 10 times faster than these two, it will say, hey, it, it, it will go back and ask for messages 10 times more often. And therefore it will get 10 times the workload and we don't have to code any of that logic. It's just up to the service to say, hey, I'm here, please send me something else. 
So that's what I mean when I say it's automatically load balancing. We don't have to have a bunch of complex logic in Redis to monitor the CPU of these three and monitor the memory and monitor the network and monitor the, monitor the total number that they're working or have worked. We just leave it up to the services to decide when they're, to decide when they're ready to do something. So uh, any questions on that so far? I know I've been talking a lot and been talking kind of fast. Also, if I need to slow down my speech, uh, please let me know because I, I tend to I tend to speed up and speed up and not realize I'm no not you're you're that. okay. I, I all good so far. I'm 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 keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, okay. We don't have any questions so far. Okay. Um, but that's... well, I think I just have oh uh, I have two more slides and then I'll get into the examples. So Sorry. after that long introduction, oh, hold on. we do have Des. Hi Des, how yeah. are you? Hi, Mick. How's it going? Come here. I just I have a question. I just want to work out what's what here in terms of what's Redis and what the each minion is. Is okay. like are the, are the minions a cluster of computers that are nope. in a they server? Are, what, I, will, uh, I will be talking about that next, but essentially what the minion is, is it's it is a service that exposes locally installed packages and functions. So it's literally a way of saying, hey, I want to execute the pnorm function from the stats package, or I have this custom, uh, this custom package that has this model I'm interested in. It happens to be installed on these three services. I want you to execute this function uh, uh, and whatever service happens to have that, we'll pick it up, execute that function and return the results. So it's literally, Think of it as this service is just an instance of R that happens to have some packages installed. And presumably, that, the, okay, the, yeah, yeah. The message you're sending also contains. So, sorry, actually, that's prompted a couple of questions. I, yeah, I, that, that will actually be in the next uh, oh, next fine, slide. I will fine. be talking yeah. about uh, how these messages work and how you're actually telling the service what to do. Right. Fine. So you combine all of that I'll sit on into. My hands. No, you're fine. You're totally fine. Uh, so we combine all of that into the R minions package. And I, I, this sentence was literally all I could think of. What is R minions? Well, it's a package of functions that allows you to build and communicate with R microservices via Redis. That, that's all it is. And in fact, the library itself is not that complex. If you look at the, let's see, can I, uh, sorry, this bar's in my way. Uh, maybe I can. Sorry, give me just a second. I can't, ah, there we go. Um, if you look at the package itself, it is five functions, blacklist, get message, minion worker, send message, and send response. And of these, only three of them are actually exported. Blacklist and send response are internal. So it's a very small package and the all it is is a package that tries to provide functions so that one, you can start a service that connects up to Redis and starts listening to requests. And then it provides function facilitating commu communication as a user. So instead of having to bundle all of this stuff into a message that you then connect up to Redis and then figure out how to send it, no, you just pass all of your information to this one function and then it sends it up to you. And then you have a separate function for going back and getting the results. I'll, I'll, I'll dig more into, uh, into those in a minute. Um, so as I said a, a second ago, literally all this is doing is it's providing a way that you can serve up any function in a locally installed package. So if you have the G, well, okay, I won't say the ggplot package. I've, I've played around with plotting. You can do it, but it's, it's a bit hard and I don't remember if it's natively supported. You have to do a little bit of work with binary strings and stuff like that. But say that I build a, a, built a, a, a crop insurance cat model and I called it the package crop cat. As long as I have the crop cat uh, package installed in that instance of R, then I'm serving up all of the functions that are in that crop cat model. So if I pass it whatever inputs it needs to run, It'll uh, make a prediction from my model and it'll send me the results back. Now, one thing you might be thinking is, okay, well, some functions I use on the command line and they aren't in a package. Sequence, rnorm, all of these, all of these functions, they're just right there on the, on the command line available. They, they don't look like they're in a package. Turns out they are in packages. It just are, when you start it, preloads some of these packages. So like the sequence function, that's in the base package. The pnorm function is in the stats package. And if you dig through these packages, you'll find pretty much every function you're familiar with that you can just find natively on the command line is in one of these two packages. So uh, the, the core functionality- if you, And if you use the internal help, it'll tell you which package it's in as well. 
Yes, it will. You just go question mark like SEQ and it will say you'll actually see package base as part of the documentation. So um, even though I said there are five functions in this package, there's really only one function that is the core functionality of it. You could have this entire package with just the one function minion worker. You could get rid of all of the other four functions and it would still, you, you would have to rework it a little bit because they depend on each other, but you could rework it to where you just have the minion worker function and that is it. What this minion worker function does is it connects up to a Redis host and then it starts monitoring a queue. And when it gets a request, it knows how to break apart that message, analyze that message to figure out what it needs to do. It then does it, and then it responds in a similar formatted message, and then it reconnects to the queue and says, hey, I'm ready to do something again. And uh, basically all this takes is the host and port, which is the information for your Redis server, jobs queue, which is the name of the queue that you wanna send the request to, Use JSON, this is a Boolean, basically telling you whether you're going to send your requests as a JSON object or whether you're going to send them as a serialized uh, binary object in R. And then finally, whitelist, which basically is, uh, it, it's, I, I believe it's optional, but it's recommended. It, this is something I added recently for security. So let's talk a little bit about this blacklist whitelist and what the messages contain. Uh, and before I actually talk about this, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to take a step back and talk about the first version of this package I built. So when I gave this presentation back in 2016, it was, uh, this package was a bit more archaic. So back then I was still learning about R and how to build packages, and I still had trouble building packages. I couldn't quite get the the, the description right, or some of the R project files. And I, it was just a nightmare getting all of this stuff to build. But eventually, thanks to, uh, thanks to Hadley Wickham and, and R Studio. Tools. I was gonna and, say yes, dev, dev tools. tools. <laughs> it, it used to be an absolute, yeah, it was a, like dev tools made a huge difference in terms of making that stuff easier. Yes, and now that you can install directly from like a GitHub repository makes it even even that much easier. So because of that, my first version, it tried to shy away from packages at all costs. So I figured out how to build the R minions package. I got the code right to where it would build for the most part each time. And that was it. I didn't care about building another package for the rest of my life. So I had to figure out, okay, well, this is gonna have to run some sort of custom code. So the very first version, you actually had to define a function as a string and send that to the service. And then the R service would take that string, parse it and run that as an inline function. It was nasty. It, it, I hated it so much and it caused so many problems, especially when you had like typos, debugging was impossible, figuring out if it was a problem with the service, figuring out if it had the right versions of the packages, all of this stuff. It was a nightmare. Yeah, it's uh, also a major security hole. <laughs> yes, huge security <laughs> arbitrary, hole. Arbitrary code, yeah, not good. So uh, so once I started learning more about building packages, packages and learning computer programming more, I started becoming more friendly with packages and realized, all right, packages are great. We should always just bundle our code into a package. It helps us with testing. It helps us with deploying. It helps us with versioning. And packages just solve a lot of these problems. So I started exploring packages more and more. And once I, I, once I feared them less and less and started building more of my own package. And from there, I was like, okay, well, what if we just started serving functions? We say, I want to execute this function, give it the name of the function, and we don't have to actually send all of that crazy code or arbitrary code anymore. As such, version two uh, was born where you cannot send any form of arbitrary code anymore. You have to send it the name of the package and you have to send it the name of the function. That is the only way it will ever know to execute anything but there's still some scary functions that will allow you to execute code on the command line or allow you to stop the R process or things like that. So consequently, I was like, okay, we need to have some blacklist or whitelist. I think we're now uh, starting to call those block lists and allow lists and things like that. Uh, so basically the blacklist, uh, the, it, the blacklist is built into the package. And right now I think it only blocks two, uh, two functions. And I think both of those involve running commands on the command line. If you happen to configure- Yeah, I imagine like, exec is one of them. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, if you happen to configure a whitelist, then it completely ignores the blacklist. So if you want to expose XSEC for some reason, cool, put it in your whitelist and you can access it. Uh, so basically what I really like is that the whitelist it ensures nothing falls through the cracks. It only allows what is in this list. If you haven't put it in this list, good luck. You're never going to be able to run it. So I prefer and I recommend using a whitelist. As such, I haven't even exposed this blacklist. Right now in this current version, I don't think there is any way you can edit this. Um, now in the future, I might expose this and make it editable. But for now, I've just been use a whitelist. It solves lots of problems and it is the safest out of everything. And last, let's talk about what the message is, how it communicates. Well, as I said earlier, a message is just a string. So now, just so I'm clear here, Jonathan, in my head. So this is basically, you have, you've spun up like an instance of R and this is how you tell the Redis queue that this machine is going to be available to do jobs. Uh, I'm sorry, no. So this minion worker function here is how you tell the queue it's available. It connects right. up to the host and the port and tells it what it wants to listen on. And okay. then it just waits there and it says, I'm listening. But it needs to know what to listen for. So you need to be able to send Redis the correct format so that the, the, the minion knows, knows how to deal with it. And in doing that, you have to send it a message that contains these four parameters, gotcha. package, func, parameters right. and results queue. And basically package is the name of the package. So it's just a string. Funk is the name of the function. So it's also a string. Parameters are any parameters that this function requires to execute. So like in terms of your P norm, I think it needs Q for quantiles yeah. and it might also need main, mean and standard distribution. And then finally, you need to also tell it where to send the results to when it's done. Now, typically, this is just a completely random queue that is specific only to the person or the client requesting it. So like generate a UUID or, or yeah. a name that also contains your process ID or something that it is just unique to you. So a different client doesn't happen to be picking up your messages. Now, there's also some additional information you can provide. One of them is an error queue. So if you would like to redirect your errors to a separate location so you can know that successes are here, errors are here, you can do that if you wish. I typically send them to the same location and just make the client deal with that. Uh, the client will then parse through and figure out if it was a success or error and how to deal from, with it from there. But the functionality is there to redirect if you wish. Now, there's also some helper functions. I'll go over these in the examples. Uh, and basically, all of the all these are, are ways to simplify the process of sending a message and getting a response back. Um, these helper functions are in R, but if you want to access any of your R services from another language, such as JavaScript, Python, Java, C Sharp, you'll have to build that manually. Um, but I think I provide in the documentation how to do that. And basically, if you're going to access your, your worker from a different language other than R, then you want to set this use JSON equal to true because that binary to yeah. obj and obj to binary don't exist in other languages. So in the examples I work today, I'll show you what the messages look like with use JSON true and with use JSON false, but all of the work will be done using JSON messages because the final example I will give will actually be running uh, some R simulations from Node.js. So the last slide, and I swear this is the last slide before I get to the examples, I'm just going to give a brief talk about Docker. And the reason I'm talking about this is because this is, Docker simplifies so much of the deployment process and so much of the quick testing process. And it basically, what, what Docker is, is it's a way of running code in a container. Well, what's a container? A container you can kind of think of as like a headless VM, a headless virtual machine. So you have these Docker images that are stored somewhere and they contain all of the code that needs to be run. They contain the information for a basic operating system. They contain the information that you've installed for Redis or R or this service or that. Basically, if you were going up and setting, like a, setting up a Linux server somewhere and you're doing your apt install, these packages, you're doing the exact same thing in a Docker. But what happens is when you turn it off, you can move that Docker anywhere you want. You can ship it to another server if you want. And then when you turn it back on, it comes back up and it's running that exact same version of Linux with those exact same packages you installed, running the exact same command that you told it to run. 
it's it, it makes your code super portable. And I'm, because of that, it makes it really easy for people to pull it down and play around with it without having to understand it very much. Yeah, I'm going to be talking a bit about I'm I'm giving where we will oh, well, I'll talk about this at the end, but I'm going to be talking a bit more about containerization and Docker uh, in next month's meetup, which we awesome. hope will be in person. But yeah, awesome, it's, awesome. it's it's even brilliant for research work, which is kind of the focus I'm going to have. But yeah, I, pretty much I it, my, when I started a brand new project, it used to be I would create a GitHub repo. Now I create a GitHub repo and copy across my make file and my Docker file and build a Docker image to run everything in. And that's kind of become part of my project initiation. Yeah, it's crazy how it's it's become so ingrained in my work because I I refused to learn Docker for the longest time. I was like, I've learned so many technologies. I don't want to mm. learn something else. And then I finally forced myself to. I'm like, this is brilliant. Oh my <laughs> yeah, god. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I have another story about how I, I've been meaning to for ages, but I couldn't quite figure out how to use it just because of my particular use case. But anyway, that's a story for another day. <laughs> so, um, so as such, uh, I've actually published a Docker image that contains an installed version of the Minion. And if you pull it down and you launch it, it starts up and uh, you, you basically give it a Redis host and Redis port. You launch it, it will connect up to Redis and it will start monitoring for messages. Literally all it does is, uh, in fact, I can probably, I can show you the code. Let's, I wasn't gonna bring this up, but, oh no. Sorry, this bar is just in my way. Um, basically all that Docker file did, uh, uh, does was uh, the, the file itself to find some environment variables, does some installing of packages from Ubuntu, installs dev tools and installs the R minions package. And then there's just a little shell script that uh, uh, run minion.shell. And all of that, all that does is takes those environment variables and passes them into that minion worker function I showed you a second ago. And that's it. It literally just executes minion worker and then you're done until you turn off the Docker. It'll just stay up serving, serving your different R functions indefinitely. And if you want to host a custom package, you basically build a Docker file that says from peacemaker slash R minion. And then you go through the same process of installing your dependencies. You install your uh, install whatever custom package or custom packages you want to serve up, and then you use run minion again, and you're just running an instance of R that happens to have those packages installed you want to access, and you go. And it, because of that, this Docker provides the seamless scale up and scale down. Uh, I, the best I've ever seen. So if if I'm in the middle of processing, I'll show this in, in the examples, but if I'm in the middle of processing and my boss comes to me and he says, hey, how long is that going to take? And I'm like, it takes three days. Well, is there any way we can cut that down? Well, if you let me launch a 20 core server in AWS, I can spin up 20 of these Docker images real quick and they'll instantly connect up and start processing, but it'll cost you a hundred dollars. Okay, do it. So you launch a server, you send your Docker image up, you launch 20 instances of those, they connect up to Redis and they start processing. Just like in the work, uh, just like in the workflow here, you have your Kevin and Stuart that were working, you need to spin up something else, you just turn something on, it connects to Redis and then it goes. So that's enough of PowerPoint slides. Let's actually get into what is going on here. Let's see some of it. So. I am running this tool here called Redis Commander. Basically, I'm just running a Redis server in AWS and I have this Redis Commander so that we can see what is going on inside of Redis. We can look at what messages are there, what processing is happening. So right now, nothing, nothing is in our server. Our server is completely empty. So let's look at this first example. So in R, I load the Redux package and then high Redis is the function that you use to connect to a server. Right now my server is located at this IP address. So my Redis connection is now complete. That's it, done. Now I want to send a message. So I'm going to specify a connection, RedisCon, specify the name of the package, the name of the function I wanna execute. So in this case, it'll be QNorm. Spec uh, now QNorm requires P of probability. It has default mean and standard deviation, but I wanna use a different one. So I give it 110 for the mean and standard deviation. And then I have to tell, uh, 
tell it what, what queue to send it to. In this case, I want to send it to a queue that's not listed, not being monitored, because I want to actually look at the message and see what it looks like. So let us run this function. We get a one, that means it succeeded. And now let's go back to our Redis. We see now we have this test queue key. Well, let's open that up and let's see what that looks like. All right, this is mostly meaningless, This, but we, we see some stuff we recognize, UTF-8, stats, queue norm. I don't know what this stuff is, but it's probably something to do with some of the parameters that were passed. The reason it looks like this is I didn't actually specify use JSON. So it's using the, or it's using the default false. So it's actually run that message through the bin to obj or obj to bin, converted that to a binary string and sent it over the wire to Redis as a binary string now. And basically what it is, is all objects in R are lists, and then I either convert them to a binary string list or I convert them to a JSON object list um, when it gets sent to Redis. When it comes back from Redis, it gets, uh, it gets converted back and it will be a list again. So what happens if we send that using use JSON true? Well, if we refresh this, we see there are now two keys here. And now you see the most recent, the top one, this is a lot more legible because it is using JSON. So now it has key package, value stats, key funk, package queue norm, value uh, key parameters, value another object, which has all of the different parameters that you need in order to execute that function. It tells it where to send the results to. And in this case, it's sending the errors to a separate queue. That's all the message is, is just a string that tells it the vital information to execute. And just so I'm, I'm, I'm clear on what I'm looking at here. So each job is an entry in the Redis queue in this particular test queue. That is correct. And, but you could have another queue which was representing something else and that would have different messages as well. Yep. So typically yeah. what we do is all of these queues live in the central repository. So to connect right. up to them, you just, you have a one connection string across the board. And then when I was talking about uh, the different services, the different microservices you could have, each of these is a different queue. So it might be billing service queue, claim right. service queue, report service queue. Um, right. If you wanted to have everything go to a single queue, you could, but then you would have to have something bridging that to where yeah that bridge would parse out that message and then figure out where to navigate all of the messages yep. to. But Just then that provides another separate. bottleneck. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, let's see where I was on. No, I was on, You're on Redis, uh, Commander. Redis Commander. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is literally all the message is, is it's a string with information on what to do and how to do it. And then the service itself will pick this up, it will break apart this message, it will look at package and func to look up the function, it will look for the parameters to figure out how to execute it, and then once that execution is done, if it was a success, it will send it to the results queue, whoops. If it was an error, it will send it to the error queue, and then that's it, that is, that is all it has to do. So I currently have uh, four instances running in AWS right now. And uh, basically I built, a, uh, I built a Docker image, Steal the Moon, that all it did was it extended. In fact, I can, I can look at this. Oh no, did that freeze on me? Oh no. The joys of live coding, I love it, Jonathan. Yeah, uh, give me just a second. Don't I worry should about be it. able to connect back up to these. Hopefully, hopefully there. Hopefully, it was just my connection that died, and not actually my uh, machine. Uh, yes, my VM. Uh, oh, what's the IP address? Oh, wait, broken pipe, perfect. Okay, good, the machine's still up. Okay, good, they're still up. So let me look here, is that still running? Oh no, that just died. 
that'll that'll actually be a good thing. That'll that that will allow me to show you what's what's going on here. So let me open up this Docker file real quick. I basically when I built the R minions package, I built a separate uh, repository called Steal the Moon, and the entire purpose of that repository is is just to serve as an example. So I built a simple package with a simple cat model completely meaningless cat model. It's just something I threw together and uh, just having fun with. And then I did that so I could provide a Docker file that shows how you take the underlying R minion package. You install some additional uh, uh, some additional dependencies, update everything. And then you copy over your new uh, your new package and you install that. And then you run your minion just like you would previously. And all of a sudden yeah. this steal the moon package is available. So I, I built that and then I used Docker Compose to launch it. And when you use Docker Compose, you can actually tell it how many instances to run. So in this case, I'm gonna run four instances of my worker. So that's it, they're up, they've connected to Redis, they're monitoring, they're ready to run. So if I send this, I'm now just going to use the default jobs queue. I send that and then I say get message and all of a sudden there's the results. Now the response gives you some information uh, that was passed in and it also gives you the results as a separate queue. So we see here, we were passed package stats, func queue norm. You can probably tell that this is just an R list. It went in as JSON, it came back out as, as JSON and then it was broken into a list. Here's all of the parameters that were sent, the results queue, all of that information. Status tells us whether it was successful or whether it was an error. And finally, the results. Well, what were we looking for? We were looking for the, the quantiles of 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1 for a standard normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation 10. These look about right. Uh, our zero and one are minus infinity to infinity. Our 50% quantile should be the mean 100. And then to the left and the right of those, those look to be about one standard deviation away or uh, yeah, uh, to be equivalent of the, the, the one standard deviation. So overall, that seems like that executed that function. And literally what I just did was I have a Redis server connected uh, running in AWS. And I have four instances of my R minions running in AWS connected to that Redis server. The Redis server is running in Ohio. I am here in Lubbock, Texas connected to that Redis server as well. I sent it a message. That message said stats, QNORM, and here's all of the information. It went to that Redis. That Redis sent it to the first worker that connected to it. That worker broke apart that message and said, oh, you want to execute QNORM. All right, I'll execute QNORM. It executed it, it took the results, sent those results back to Redis and Redis said, okay, you were the one who asked for this. Here, here's your results. Go do with them as you will. Uh, let's see, so that is literally what is happening here. So that very basic example doesn't really show the power of what you could do. So I went in and as I said a minute ago, I built a catastrophe model. One of the things I really like doing in my crop insurance is building catastrophe models, but a single run can take a while because they have to have lots of pieces that are interconnected, generating random, uh, random you, numbers from sometimes Can you just complex, explain quickly what a cat model is? Oh, yes. So, um, yeah, my, my apologies. And why it's, and why keep, it's important. I keep thinking I'm talking to the uh, insurance data science people. <laughs> uh, so okay. basically what a catastrophe model is, is it's a... It is a, a non-parametric model uh, or a way of trying to model your data in a parametric way to get a non-parametric distribution as a result set and using that to then make inference. So in a classical model, you have your inputs, you run it through like, like let's say a linear, linear model. You have your inputs, your model has your coefficients, you multiply your inputs by those coefficients, add them together and you have your value, you spit that back out. Well, a, a lot of times the processes we deal with, they're too complex to, to, to be modeled deterministically. We have our weather, we have our soil, we have all of these crazy pieces of data. So one of the best ways to model them is through a catastrophe model, a process model. So instead of, um, of trying to find a one model fits all, we try to fit sub models. So maybe a log normal distribution fits this one area. And maybe we know that this data is interconnected with this piece of data over here. So like maybe the price and the yield, um, or maybe the, maybe the uh, crop yields are inversely correlated with the prices. When the yields are good, the prices go down. 
when yields are bad, the prices go up. So we build in correlations between the random draws for the prices and the random draws for the yields, making sure that they're still inversely correlated every single time we generate them. So it's basically lots and lots of trying to account for different correlations and interconnectedness, but then just generating random events that follow that pattern. You do that 10,000 times, then you summarize your 10,000 results, and then you use that to figure out what's your average, what are your quantiles and all of this. So it's basically using parametric, uh, a way of taking parametric models, connecting them together and using them to build a non-parametric model. Um, but as such, that can take a lot of computing time. So with some of the models I take, they can run for 30 seconds a minute just on a single prediction. Uh, and if you need to do that 10,000 times, that can take you a while. So what would we like to do? Scale this across lots of servers. So instead of taking 30 seconds to do one, maybe I take 30 seconds to do 20 and I can do 20 concurrently. That'll, that'll, that'll process through that stuff a lot faster. So I uh, built a small package that has a very simple catastrophe model. Uh, I, I built this, I think, three years ago. So I don't remember entirely what this does. But I think basically what the point was, was saying, OK, I'm going to fly to the moon and back. Uh, what are my fuel costs? Well, there might be asteroids. There might be solar wind. There might be all of these things that I either have to dodge or is going to push against me. And that's going to affect my fuel costs. So I, uh, this simulation takes some inputs for the interconnectedness information. And then from there, it generates random numbers of solar flares, random numbers of asteroids. It uh, has some correlation structures, some dependent structures built into these. And then it simulates from all of that, ensuring that dependent structure is followed. And then it returns the output of, of the simulation. So that function lives in the steel to moon package. And I conveniently just built a Docker image that installed the steel to moon package and then connected up to Redis. So the first thing I need to do is generate some parameters to run, uh, run this with. And they're just simple numbers. You can see here just numbers for base fuel, numbers for solar flares. You can see here the base fuel is using a, a, a Gaussian copula with some sort of mean and standard deviation and basically just information for this internal dependence structure. Well, then I can send that to the queue. What happens if I do that? Oh, look, I already have a result. Whoops. And we see all of the information we sent that with package steal the moon, funk simulate trip, parameters, all of this information, and finally our results, which themselves were built into a list object because we wanted to know what segments did the asteroids occur, how many asteroids were there, how much additional fuel cost was there to avoid the asteroids, what was our total fuel cost, how did um, so we break up all of this information and we also summarize it. And then from there, that was one run of our simulation. Well, we need to do that 10,000 times. The simulation takes about one and a half seconds. So what happens if we just send a bunch of these up there? Well, I sent that to the Redis server and oh, come on, where is it? Oh, that didn't run. So this is actually a good point. So this, if you're unfamiliar with HTOP, this is just the tool that allows you to monitor the CPUs. So up here shows that I have four CPU cores and they're currently not processing anything, but I'm about to send 10,000 jobs. And you just let's did make the it... first line of the four. Yes, I did. I was trying yeah. to figure out why it wasn't picking anything up. Uh, and I'll actually, I'll just do, I'll do a thousand so it doesn't take too long. You might need to close out the for loop though. Uh, I think I did. Oh, no, it just ran. Yeah. It just ran, actually. Yeah. No, I, I, I escaped it. Ah. So now if I run that, keep in mind, a second ago, these were doing nothing. Now, this is a completely separate server from the Redis server that just happens to have connected to the Minion server. You can even see the actual command that's being run here, um, running R through the command line, loads the R Minions package, runs the Minion worker, connects up to this host, this port, this queue, all of that information. And now I've just sent in a thousand jobs and it's running a job. All four of these are running a single job. And then once it gets that result, it sends the response and it says, hey, is there another one? And it's just keeping through cycling as fast as it can. And if we look over here, we can kind of see, all right, we have 521 left. So it's worked 479 of them. 
as we refresh, oh wait, that was the results queue, not the jobs queue. You can just see these numbers changing mm. as everything gets processed. And eventually, once everything is done, the processor cores will go back to zero because it will just be monitoring. It will no longer be working anything. So we will let this finish and then I will show you, ah, there we go. It's finished processing. All of those, pro all of those CPUs drop back down to idle. And if we look over here, we should have results queue of length of thousand. And if we look in there, we see all of this information that looks very much like what we saw a minute ago in R all of our responses as JSON objects. Now, right now, you might be asking yourself, well, what's the good of these being in the results queue? You, you need to actually go out and get the results and line those up with whatever, uh, uh, whatever the requests were if you want. Uh, but basically, you know where it lives. And then from there, it's just a matter of running that, this function, uh, get message, and you can go through and you can pull the, res the responses out of the queue and then use them. As Presumably, you Jonathan, could you have a minion that actually pulls the results off the results queue and like writes it to a disk? So you're uh, essentially load balancing your disk IO as well. So you probably could, although I don't know if you would want that, uh, necessarily a minion for that because the minion is, uh, since, since all of these results aren't necessarily going to the same place, uh, actually, no, you could probably run one that monitors the results queue. I, uh, no, I don't think that would, you, you would have to build a separate minion out uh, uh, aside from the minion worker because right now the minion worker, its entire job is to break apart the message, figure out that package funk and then execute that. Right. So if you, if you put a minion on that response, it's going to take that response and it's gonna see, oh, there's a package and funk here and it's gonna to try to re-execute that job. Um, but yes, you could definitely build something that scrapes all of this information if you wanted. Uh, and in fact, I will show that in uh, JavaScript in, in my next example. This is kind of hard to do in R because R is very much a procedural language. So asynchron it, it just doesn't work very well for asynchronous coding. Yeah. Uh, but if you use an asynchronous language, as long as you can connect to Redis, we now have a way to execute R code from an asynchronous language. And then you can build whatever you need to monitor your responses and, and send those wherever it needs. Now, one thing I will say is I historically don't monitor this results queue. The way I build my functions is I actually, I think I mentioned this earlier, typically I have my functions connect up to a database to get the data they need to run with. Well, then I also have them connect up to the database and just save the results to the database. Because in the end, I'm going to be putting them in a database anyway. The only question right. is, am I going to be scraping this results queue and then storing that data in a database? Well, why can't I just have the minion connect up to the database and save it directly to the database yeah. for me? So yeah. that is that is actually what I found to be the most uh, the most streamlined so, form of running these models. So the Redis is really just metadata management rather than Pretty actual, much. yeah. Yep. Okay. And uh, uh, let's see, what was I? Ah, I forgot that thought. But yeah, oh, uh, yeah. And uh, so because of that, I build, uh, I sometimes build shiny dashboards. And I found that that makes the shiny dashboard uh, update automatically, because basically, you just build a shiny dashboard pointed to a table. And then whenever you need, uh, whenever you need to update your models or rerun your models, you run your models those models store directly in the database and the shiny dashboard has just been built to query that table and find all of the information in there and then display it in the way it needs. Yeah. So uh, whenever I'm doing updates of my model runs for a new year and whatnot, I just kick it off and then I tell my boss, hey, it's running, you'll see a few results. And then throughout the day, more and more results will populate and I'll let you know when all of the results are there. That way, if you wanna look at the preliminary results, you can, if you just wanna wait for the final results, I'll let you know. So uh, the very last uh, example I'm going to run is actually going to be a two-part example. Um, and it's going to be doing exactly what I just did, but it's going to be doing it from inside of JavaScript. And I'm also going to show bringing up a new instance of a server in the middle of it. So you can see how I can just launch new instances and they'll in immediately pick up jobs and start going. So um, let me show you, I'm gonna show a little bit of node code here. If you don't know node, 
not a problem. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm mainly going to be showing this as a, this is what I'm doing from a different language, not so much analyze this code. So I have a node script that basically connects up to Redis. I have two connections um, because one of them is going to be blocking, but I need to make sure that I keep sending, uh, sending requests while I'm waiting on the responses. Here, I don't have that generate parameters function that we used, this uh, per, uh, generate simulation parameters. I don't have that in Node, so I have to hard code the parameters with which to run. But you can see here, we have the exact same information that we, we have in R. So we define our base fuel with the copula, mean logs, standard log, our solar flares parameters, and our asteroid parameters. Then I specify the queue I'm gonna be using, and then, I, uh, in this case, I'm only going to do one of them. I'm gonna do one of them just so you can show, uh, you can see that this is accessible from Node. And then I specify a, just a random place to send the results. So I know what it is, but nobody else cares. And then I build the message. Message has to have package, has to have func, has to have parameters, which was that object that we had a second ago. Have to tell it the results queue and the error queue. In this case, I'm sending them to the same place. And finally, I decided to send an ID in case I wanted to do any, in case I wanted to, to match these back up to the requests later on down the road. Then I have my Redis connection. I'm just pushing these into the jobs queue, and then I'm going to pop from that response queue until eventually I get a response. And then from there, I will pretty much just log it out. So right now I'm just going to do this once and I should be logging out. Yes, I'm logging out result there. So if I just do node example, I run that, it waits a second and voila, there are the results just like we saw them in R. So it contains the number of solar flares, the surface area, base fuel, the additional fuel for each flare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of the results of that, um, that run of that one simulation. Well. That was neat, but sure, if we're gonna do one of them, might as well just do that locally. Well, let's change this back to doing a thousand. And I no longer wanna log out a thousand results. So I will comment out that console log. Now let's go take a look real quick. So I have two servers. Again, they aren't doing anything. This server here is running four instances. This running, this is running zero instances. So let us run node example. Now, if we look over here, all of a sudden I started running that and this, these four instances, they, the, the, the Redis server is sending them jobs as fast as it can. So their CPU is pegged out. But this one over here, remember I, oh, it is running them, curses. I thought I turned this one off. So I'm turning this one off in the middle of processing. So this is actually currently going to lose a bit, little bit of information. There are ways to safely uh, tear them down. I've not built that into the R minions library though, just because I haven't really cared enough about it. Uh, typically I'm not turning services off until I'm actually done processing. But in the future, I might look into doing that. So right now, we have our H top. Okay, now there's nothing running on that one. This one's still processing. Oh, that one finished. That was fast. Let's up this to 10,000. Let's make sure here. Can I clear this out? Oh, no, 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 don't disconnect. All right, this is kind of, um, there's typically what happens is the key gets, gets deleted uh, whenever the job has been uh, finished processing or has been, has been pulled out from the queue. But since I, uh, since I just uh, stopped the processes manually, some of this is going to be left hanging out. So it, it's a little cluttered. Typically your Redis will not be this cluttered. Uh, so let me kick this off once more. And now this server, just like before, uh, it starts picking up the jobs. And this one here is not doing anything. Well, what if we need to process faster? Well, we spin up a new server, ship over our Docker image, Docker compose up scale. Now we're starting them, says it's running. And look, all of a sudden 
We just started four instances that connected up to that Redis queue. And now we have eight instances of our service processing through all of our catastrophe model. And then once we're done, if we don't need to process this anymore, we just turn off the servers like nothing ever happened. We stop racking up AWS costs and we'll turn them back on next time we need them. So with that, that is pretty much everything I have. So if there are any other questions, it actually looks like there's a few numbers in the chat. Let's see. So uh, one thing that occurs to me, and I'm very conscious of your time, John, because I'm, I'm, I appreciate it. it's still a work day for you in Lubbock. But um, so it's a it's it's quite a generic thing that you're doing. Have you looked at like is is I appreciate when you did this, it wasn't like you kind of had to has has much of the cloud services kind of made some of this redundant or do you still find like this what you've written and what you're using still useful because it it kind of scratches an itch the cloud services don't do so for me i still find it quite useful because this was built specifically for uh the architecture at my company yeah. so right now since all of our stuff works on redis message queues if i ever want to launch a model that we access from our application well it's already there right available yeah. in redis uh, I know other people are exploring ways of, of streamlining some of this stuff. I haven't looked into it in a while just because I haven't needed to. Yeah. Uh, but I do know that Redis has actually become more common in, in R for parallel computing. I believe uh, some of the do libraries, there's actually a do Redis now, yeah. which I want to say do work similar, oh, excuse me, work similar to the snow package. Right. and the way you actually build the jobs but then uh behind under the hood the different libraries that use the different technologies are handling yeah. that to, to to ship it off to different places so i haven't looked into how this compares to the do redis library but just looking at the api itself i never really liked the snow api so i'm not really yeah. i don't think i'm a fan of the do api yeah no i don't really like do i use parallel like within a machine parallelization using fur rather than per which uses futures to kind of decouple the calculation but uh, i i much prefer like what you've described because um well for two reasons and one is that you kind of write if i've got it right your jobs you essentially wrap into a package so that you, if you have a bunch of different simulation types you would either put them into one package or into a separate package for each one so it gets nice and modular and i really mm -hmm. like that because you can test it like you said there's things you can do but also you can actually have multiple machines which is great so you can actually and i think fur can do that but it can get a bit messy this is very very nice you literally just create a minion and away it goes Yep, and with just, Docker, you don't even have to worry about dependencies. That yeah. was a, that was a big problem I had back in 2016 yeah. when I first gave the presentation. It took me yeah. it took me a good four hours to set up all of my servers and and, and make sure yeah. they were correct. And I was still sweating on presentation day. This took me 10, 15 minutes tops, yeah. and most of that was actually just installing Docker itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Um. Does anyone, I'm presuming no one has any questions, but I'll throw out a final call. Um. Oh, and uh, before I forget, so if anybody is interested in the slides, it's literally just a web address. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if there's a way to like include this in, in, as a comment on the meetup or anything. Uh, there is, yeah, you, you can. That. And if, if you can't do it, I can certainly do it. And okay. I will, I usually kind of do a wrap up on LinkedIn tomorrow. And I'll put the link on it as well. That works. I'll, so that usually, and usually that gets some stuff. But yeah, I mean, um, not just some positive comments. Yes, I'd like to use this work. And actually, I, I, I actually have a use case for this. I think that I, I might actually ping you offline. Jonathan about, absolutely about so so anybody anybody who, who, who's still here um if you are interested well, pretty much in everyone this, is I... here okay we had one person okay. drop off which is which is great 
Um, uh, I, I know we've gone a little long, so I and I know I talk a lot, so I, I, I hope people aren't too bored right now. Um, but uh, yeah, if if anybody is is interested in using this, I, I I've never got around to publishing this on CRAN, but it's pretty easy to yeah. install from uh, from GitHub, and then like I said earlier, it's available uh, as a pre-built Docker image, so you have yeah. to do even less. I've tried to document this as best as I can in readmes and providing examples yeah. and stuff, but if you run into any issues, hit me up. Um, I, I provided my Twitter and uh, I, I, I think my email address is available on my GitHub page. So if you want to reach out to me, I will I will do my best to try to walk you through and help you work out uh, any issues you might be having. Great. And if anybody uh, if anybody has any any thoughts on ways to make the package better, uh, feel free to open issues or pull requests would be great, too. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, how do oh just one actually I do I want to do, do I mean there's no real security in this right it assumes everything there's no authentication or correct basically the 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 way the architecture works at my company and I really liked this was Redis is completely open the 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 security is controlling who can who can access it so you right. know, via network and firewall rules yeah. like, can you actually get to the redis server basically if you if you can get to the redis server we don't care anymore and yeah. then the whitelist is what tries to prevent you from being malicious and the off chance you yeah. can get to it right yeah that makes sense cool okay well thanks very much Sean. that was brilliant um like i said i have a couple of use cases even if i never implement them it's a useful thought experiment because I know this is a problem that's going to kind of crop up in the future for me. Because I, my my kind of the way I model and the way I do things, I typically run Monte Carlo simulations anyway, and they can get chunky and they can get you know doing anything realistic. You're looking at like you said, even if it's only a few seconds. Suddenly, if you're doing ten thousand or a hundred thousand of them, suddenly it becomes you know it becomes a piece of work. Yep. So uh, I, I do have uh, a couple of ideas about about uh, so i will probably be in touch but other than that we will we will wrap it there um thank you very much really appreciate it especially considering the what the six hour time difference and and taking up uh like a chunk out of your day um this will go up on youtube uh probably tomorrow maybe the day after I'm, i can't it just depends on how long it's going to take to render um if anyone else has any questions please give me a shout. But the next uh, meetup will be in person with uh, me giving my talk on Reproducible Research 2.0, which was basically an updated version of the talk, the first talk I gave after lockdown um, when we did it online, but that kind of uh, talk has kind of been lost to the ether. Um, so we're doing it in Dogpatch Labs in May. Uh, I think it's the 18th of May, which is a Wednesday. Uh, I don't think it will be a hybrid event. I think it will just be in person, but I will have the, the slides and stuff available. But I'll probably mention some of this, Jonathan, if you don't mind, because I do talk about Docker in a slightly different use case, but I really like this approach for kind of doing heavy lifting and kind of parallelization. You know, it, like many, it, it really does It really does shorten the, the calendar time to do a lot of these jobs, you know, when you can... And multi-core machines are so common now, and R is very, very single core kind of by design so yes, being able to exploit multi-core is really really useful well it also has issues because when you program for multi-core you have to worry about like race conditions and all that other nonsense that it's it's much easier to just say like monte carlo simulation is an embarrassingly parallelizable problem so let's just take advantage of that you know but uh anyway yeah so um, if anyone has any questions or anything like that and also we are always looking for speakers uh hopefully with the return to in-person events um, our usual pipeline of a, of like basically mugging people at the bar after talks and saying, hey, give us a talk. Uh, we'll, we'll come back online. Um, but um, other than that, thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who came tonight. And thank you very much, Shantan, for giving the talk. And uh, we thank hope to see you all up. soon. And thank you for the invite. No I problem at all. It. Anytime. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>